We know we know the story, I think. In fact, Laura and I could probably do it from memory for a while. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed unto his own city. And Joseph also went up with Mary, Galilee, out of David, Nazareth, and Judea, the city of David, because he was house and lineage of David. And it came to pass that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And as they were there, there were shepherds abiding in the fields by night. And suddenly, the angel of the Lord was before them the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you great tidings, which shall be to all men. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And there's more, but that's as far as my memory goes. But there's one thing, there are a number of things that had to happen before this happened. If you know the story, you know the story talks about before, before Mary, before Mary came into the story, there was another couple in the story. Does anybody remember who they were? Who were they? Zacharias and Elizabeth. Zacharias was in the temple. It was his turn to do a particular thing, burn incense, and there were people all around him. While he's in there, the angel Gabriel comes to him and rocks his world. Tells him that his prayers have been answered. That his wife Elizabeth is going to have a, have a son. And then he tells him all about that son. And that son's going to be named John. That John's going to be John the Baptist. And he told him all about the ministry of the son that he's about to have. And then he did something. Do you remember what he did? What did he say? What caused that to happen? He doubted. And he said, how can this be? I'm an old, I'm an old man. My wife Elizabeth is elderly too. And how can this be? And the angel told him how it could be. Then he, then he told him that he, would, that he would need to be, that he would be quiet now because he did not, he did not believe. Later, his wife began to believe when she found out that she was pregnant. And all those things, and the theme behind what I'm sharing with you as briefly as I can, is that, is that God depends on us to do what we need to do. A lot of people obeyed the Lord before that birth ever, ever came. What I wanted to share with you was was the story Mary's story. Now I could go on and tell Joseph's, and then we could go on and on and on. But if you get the gist of this, you'll get the gist of what all of it would have been had we read it all. This is in this is in Luke. It's in chapter one. Now Elizabeth. Elizabeth is already pregnant. Zacharias is already the father. He can't speak. And while Elizabeth is pregnant, 
This is what happens. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Same angel. This time the angel sent to a virgin girl who's engaged a man whose name is Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And as the angel came in, he said to her, Hey, O favored one! And there's an exclamation point. So he didn't whisper it. <laughs> wouldn't, that wouldn't that shock you girls if you're in your boudoir and all of a sudden there's a man and he says, Hey, O favored one! You'd go, Amen! <laughs> Listen to how she responds. She was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering in her heart what kind of salutation this might be. In other words, whoa, what kind of greeting is this for a stranger in my boudoir? And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with the Lord. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give Him the throne of His father, David. And He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and His kingdom will have no end. Now can anybody remember all of that? That's a bunch. You're going to become pregnant. She's going to say in a minute, I've never been with a man. And the, and the child you're going to have is a boy. You're going to name him Jesus. He's going to be a ruler and he's going to get the throne of his father, David. And finally, finally, here's what she says. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. And then Gabriel gives her just a little something to help her know right now that what he said is true. Gabriel says this to her, And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. So she's been pregnant six months. And nothing will be impossible with God. Now how many know without looking at your Bible what Mary said? Raise your hand. Do you know? How many know what Mary said? That's, that's pretty good. In a second, you'll all be able to raise your hand. And Mary said, now this is her response. Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. She's talking about herself. Let it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. It's her response is why I shared this. I looked back and I said, well, I read the whole thing and I found out Elizabeth's response and then how Mary did this and... And I read all these things and I, and I thought, wait a minute, we're missing somebody. Who are we missing in the story? We're, we're missing Joseph. Well, it happens right after that, but it's not in Luke. You have to go to Matthew to find out. Joseph finds out that Mary's, Mary is his the bride-to-be. And he finds out, she tells him, that she's pregnant. Well, guys, I don't know what you do if the girl you're getting ready to get married tells you that she's pregnant and you know it's not you. It wouldn't be easy to believe. Joseph is troubled about it. He goes to bed and an angel comes to him in the night and tells him, don't be afraid to take Mary. The child that she's carrying is of God. to be the Son of God. And after that, Joseph's on board. Lots of people had to respond and do their part before that song, Silent Night, before that story could ever be told. I received, and this is my gift, this is the Lord's gift to me, and if you'll receive it, the Lord's gift for me to you. I was 
uh, some time back in a conference in Brown County, Indiana. And one lady who I respect very much got up and began to share some words of prophecy that were, that were being given concerning the revival that we all are praying for as many others. One thing she shared, I knew. I didn't have it memorized, but I knew it. I knew that Reverend Hellman said it, and I knew that it was in the voice in the wilderness. And this is what she shared. God is in search of a people that will trust Him with all their heart. Totally depend upon Him. A people who will always do His will in the Word, in the leading of the Holy Spirit, that will do always what He wants and will love Him with all their heart. That will obey everything He wants them to do. A people He can trust to come into their lives with the Kingdom of God. I knew, I knew where that came from. Then she shared... Then she shared words that came from Dr. George Washington Carver. <clears throat> if you don't know, George Washington Carver was a black man, <clears throat> a man of God first. And because he was a man of God, <clears throat> God also made him a scientist and such. People later were once, reporters were allowed into his laboratory. And when they were there, they got exceedingly mad. Because there was no laboratory stuff in there. Mm -hmm. You see, where George Washington Carver got his understanding is he would go out to the woods and pray at 4 o'clock in the morning. God would tell him. He would come back and do what God had told him and bada bing, bada boom. It always worked. And so God told him many things. George Washington Carver was first and above all else a man of God. And this is what he said. There's going to be a great spiritual awakening in the world. And it's going to come from people up here. <clears throat> now he was talking about people that were in the north. He's from the south. From people connected with you. That's his friend that he's talking to. And his name is Dr. Glenn Clark. And me. From plain, simple people who know not merely believe, but actually know that God answers prayer. It's going to be a revival of Christianity. Not a revival of religion. We can have a revival of religion and still have wars. But this is to be a revival of true Christianity. It's going to rise from the layman. From men who are going about their work and putting God into what they do. From men who believe in prayer and who want to make God real to mankind. When I heard that, something happened in my spirit and I cannot, I wish I could recreate it in you, but it's not possible to do that. I realized when I heard that, I realized that I was hearing the greatest gift from God that I had ever been given, I believe, since the day of my salvation. Here's the part, here's the part that hit me the revival that's going to come will rise from the layman. What's a layman? Non-clergy. It's just a, a regular Joe or Josephine. A regular person. From people who are going about their work and putting God into what they do. The revival is going to come Dr. Carver realized this. This was in 1938. This was 12 years before I was born. And I'm 69 years old. So this was a long time ago. God put it in His heart. And He was able to tell Reverend Helm that this revival that's coming is going to come from men and women who are going about doing their work. But while they're doing their regular work, whatever that is, teaching school, selling uniforms, Helping nurses and whatever it is, while you're doing your regular work, because you're putting God into what you're doing, you're doing, the Bible says, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, being a student at the high school, being a student at the college, 
being a stay-at-home mom, being a grandmother, whatever it is you're doing, the revival that's coming is going to come through you and people like you. It's not going to be the Millie, Billy Grahams. It's not going to be the Bonkies. It's not going to be the names. It's going to be the lay people. It's going to be the no-name people. It's going to be the blue-collar people in, in, in one respect. And what are they all? What do they all have in common? It's people who believe in prayer and they want to make God real to mankind. See, that's what's in me. That's why my heart was quickened. But it's what's in you. And that's why I wanted to share it today. The greatest gift I can give to you is the greatest gift that I can remember ever being given to me outside of my salvation. And this is it. Philip, while you're wrenching there in Mount Carmel and while you're wrenching on the west side of Evansville, while you're studying, while you're teaching, while you're working at the VA, while you're doing at Kimball, while you're doing whatever you're doing, and you think to yourself, God, I'm a nobody. I'm just a regular Joe. I'm an ordinary person. I mean, there's nothing special about me. But while you're driving that coal truck, while you're doing whatever it is, if your mind is focused on God and you're doing it for the Lord, driving that coal truck, teaching those kids, working with those nurses, selling those uniforms, whatever you're doing, if you're doing it for the Lord and you're bringing God into your work and God is real to you, and here's what has to burn in you. If what burns in you is that you want more than anything to God to be real to your girlfriends at school, your buddies on the ball team, the people that are selling uniforms with you, the people that are the other coal truck drivers, and you're texting them because it's in you that you want God to be in them like it is in you. The revival that comes, according to George Washington Carver, will come from people like that. Yeah. Hundreds of people, thousands of people, no-name people. Many uneducated people. Just people. Ordinary people. But they're going to have two things. They're all going to have two things in common. They're loving God. And they're doing what they're doing. Whatever it is. Make them in the plastic plant. Whatever you're doing. They're doing it as unto the Lord. And the second thing is. They've got a burning desire in them. That others will realize that relationship that they have with God. God intends with every person you know, even the people you're working with at Walmart or wherever you're working. See, to me, the greatest gift of this is that we're all included. Nobody's, nobody's excluded. Revival doesn't, it's not going to be something that maybe happens someplace else and then we go and get in on it. If God has His way, God's going to bring revival at Denny's. God's going to bring revival at the nursing home. God's going to bring revival in Ivy Tech and in the school where you teach and where you are and where you're delivering coal. That's where revival, the, the God, this revival, that's how it's going to start. And I got one last word. If you can take one more word. Yes, See, if you get that, if you get that, you say, well, I'm retired. Well, what is it you're doing? Well, I'm staying at home. What are you doing while you're at home? Well, I'm writing notes to people that are lonely. Well, then do that. I'm writing cards to people. My wife sent over 400 Christmas cards. If you didn't get one, you need to ask yourself, why didn't I get one? <laughs> I'm accused her of going down the phone book and getting names. I mean, really. <laughs> but wherever we go, people say to me, Pastor Mike, I got your card. Thank you. And I go, you're welcome. <laughs> I didn't have a thing to do it. Do with it. But you, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. That's giving right. thanks yeah. through Him. Okay. Now listen to this. After that, this, is, this came from Smith Wigglesworth. She shared all three of these things. 
I was desperate to get him. I didn't have Jana's number, so I called Missy. I said, Missy, can you get a hold of Jana? And those things that she shared, can I have them? If, if she'll allow them to be shared, can I have them? And so <coughs> Missy said, well, yes. And so Missy called Jana. Then Missy texted me back and said, yeah, she's texting them to your phone. I said, Missy, I really appreciate that, but I don't know how to get them out of my phone and get them on paper. Can, can, you, can you duplicate them? I'm an old school guy, you know. Put them on the mimeograph. I don't know. <coughs> and so, and I was so, I was so excited in my heart that I was ready to drive to Parker City, Indiana as soon as that thing came off the duplicator and get it. Now that's about a, that, it's a five hour drive that I usually make in seven. I was ready to do that just to have this paper. That's how much it meant to me. Here's the last one. The la there were three things she shared. This is the third one. There was a man in England, a man of God named Smith Wigglesworth. If you're a student of revival, you know about the name. He had a friend. His name was Lester Summerall. Lester Summerall had been all around the world. And, and he had wanted to meet Smith Wigglesworth. The Lord made the way for him to meet Smith Wigglesworth. And when they met, he came to his home. He's walking in. He's got the paper under his arm and his umbrella as, a, as an Englishman might. And Smith Wigglesworth said, you can come in, but leave that paper outside. It's full of lies. I don't want it in my house. Even then, the media was not always. But I digress. He got in with Smith Wigglesworth, and instead of saying, how are you, blah, 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 he got out the Bible and began to read. He read for 30 minutes. Then he prayed for 30 minutes. Then he got out his Bible and read for 30 minutes. Then he prayed for 30 minutes. And then he said, I must go to bed now. <laughs> and, so, and so Brother Summerall has been sitting there for 30 minutes, plus 30 minutes, plus 30 minutes. He's been sitting there for two hours. They've not had any conversation except the Word of God in prayer. And as he's leaving, Lester Summerall saying to himself, I'm a little disappointed. I was thinking maybe, you know, I would get... And as he's walking, he realizes, wait a minute, something's different in me. He received a gift, a spiritual gift, and he wasn't even able to ask for it. This, here's, this, is, a, this is the last prophecy I want to read to you. This is from Smith Wigglesworth. And this, uh, I know he was around at the beginning of World War II, so this is what he says. And after the third wave, he started sobbing. He said, I see the last day revival that's going to usher in the precious fruit of the earth. Did you understand that? I see the last day's revival that's going to usher in the precious fruit of the earth. It'll be the greatest revival this world has ever seen. It's going to be a wave of the gifts of the Spirit. The ministry gifts will be flowing on this planet Earth. Now who do you think the gifts are going to be flowing through? Us. You say, not me. Yes. When God sends revival... He's going to give every one of you, every one of us, because I still think of myself as more deacon than pastor. I've said that many times. I believe I'm going to be included in this late business because I'm still happiest when I'm cooking something or cutting wood or, you know. He said, I see this last day's revival that's going to usher in the precious fruit of the earth. <clears throat> It'll be the greatest revival this world has ever seen. It's going to be a wave of the gifts of the Spirit. The ministry gifts will be flowing on this planet Earth. He said, I see hospitals being emptied out and they will bring the sick to churches where they allow the Holy Ghost to move. Did you get that? Which churches... Which churches? It's going to be the churches where they allow the
the Holy Ghost to move. We would say the Holy Spirit to move. I have some really wonderful news for you. The revival that God is bringing, He wants to bring through you. As you're doing whatever you do, we don't need to pray you into a new occupation. Whatever you're doing right now, and whatever occupation you move into, if you're in school and you move into it, if you'll do it in word or deed as unto the Lord, and if you will let God put the fire in your heart that He wants you to have, and that is a fire that wants every man and woman, boy and girl that you know, to have the relationship with Jesus that you do. Some moment in a twinkling of an eye, you're going to find that you have the ability to do what you have never had the ability to do before. And when it happens, it won't be you doing it. It'll be God because He found a servant, a little nobody, like that little 13 or 14 year old girl, Mary, who was able to hear supernatural things that are much too big to digest, but able to say, let it be done to your servant according to your word. Are you willing? Are you willing? Because if you're willing and you start doing what's required, develop your relationship with God and to do that, you're going to have to let go of a lot of garbage. You're going to have to quit watching a lot of things. You may have to change the folks you're running around with. A lot of things may have to change. But if you'll live your life and do what you do with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you are the ones that revival will come through. Mm -hmm. And you'll be bringing them back to a church that allows the Holy Spirit to move. And I'm hoping that this will be a church that qualifies that way. Mm -hmm. There is no better news to me than to know that God has a plan and a place and a purpose for you. And all you've got to do is just keep loving Him with all your heart and be prepared to let Him do whatever He wants to do. Merry Christmas. Amen. Jesus, we thank You for the chance that You gave us to be together today. We thank You for all the gifts that were given, the gifts that were shared. We thank You we thank You, Lord, for how You helped Laura to lead us in worship. We thank You that You showed Yourself so amazingly strong in my mind because I saw You take us from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing and it all happened without human effort almost. We thank You, Spirit, for, decide, for loving us and wanting Your kingdom to live within us. Bless us this day, Lord. And we're going to let us be a blessing as we go to do our regular, normal, customary things. But we do them for you and for your glory. Amen.